Hello, um, this is an interview I'm having with Mim Tuma. She is a very well-known artist. She does uh, beautiful work and it's all geared towards nature. Mim, how are you today? Thank you, very <laughs> terrific. Good, I'm glad to hear that. I know every day can be a challenge as an artist. We don't always get what we want. Well, and, um, we want what we want is to, I think we want to live in harmony with nature. The main thing is to respond to the environment and not worry about ourselves. We're a very, very minute part of the whole picture, just like a hair on a horse's tail. And one time my mom said to me when she saw me painting a seashell, I, and I and came home after two hours and I had a finished drawing, she said, I think you could take the hair off of a horse's tail and make a painting out of that. What, what a beautiful memory you have of your mother. So she was very encouraging, I, I expect. Certainly, she was the talent in the family. I just came along and, and followed her around. And you also have that same talent. Well, she was peaceful. She had an inner spirit. And I breathed the same breath that she breathed. And for that reason, I became a quiet child. I was a good, I was isolated and living to, learning how to be by myself as a kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. so That's you, essential for being an artist, you know that. Would you consider yourself an introvert? No, no, because I wanted to speak to the public, but I, I wanted to show my energy and give them my, I was, the div, I was the dividing line, I was the vessel between the energy I saw in creation and my self. I wasn't thinking about myself when I painted. I was thinking about what I saw. I've read part of your biography and I have to say I'm very amazed at how, what an incredible writer you are, how detailed you are about your young life and your job working in, um, I guess it was Chicago in the very, fashion you're, industry. <laughs> you're, thank you. Uh, architecture. It was an architectural job I had right out of college. <clears throat> yes, mm -hmm. that was it. And that sent me on the way. I went to California. I had a scholarship in the Department of Art and Architecture. And I worked very hard. I didn't have much help from my male uh, teachers. At that time, women were just considered uh, adjuncts. We weren't important as far as our career might be concerned. We were either mothers or, or nurses or teachers. Uh, but I managed to find my way uh, through the help I had from George O'Keefe. Yes, tell us a little bit about um, her influence on you or how you met or what kind of thoughts came to your mind and how she influenced your work. And you influenced her work. Well, we were, we were, we had a similarity. I would never have planned for that, but actually I went to her with my a uh, friend on a trip across country uh, from Stanford. Uh, he wanted to get to know me better. Uh, she was on the road and I wanted to get to her know her. So I suggested we make a visit. I wrote her a letter and asked if we could come and she uh, was very positive and said, yes, come and visit. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was instrumental in uh, encouraging me from the very beginning. I went back many times on my own. Excellent. And uh, and I was able to speak with her. Uh, it, we didn't have a great deal of information on her at the time. You know, after all, there were no books on her in 1965. Mm -hmm. None at all. And she had been quite an illustrious painter and had a great history in New York. But when I found her, she was out in New Mexico, and I knew that in order to talk to her, I had to go back, and I did. After I had a scholarship in New York University, I went back and told her what I had discovered, and she listened very attentively and wanted to have me, she wanted me to continue. Excellent. And that and so made started... a relationship. Yes, I showed her what I did, and she asked me one time, how do you know so much about me? And I said, I don't. I said, I only know what you're doing because I understand what I'm doing. Interesting. And she, and she felt that that was enough. 
she loved my work. She liked my abstractions from nature. I was doing early sculptured paintings and I was also excited in every way about my research. In fact, I was in love with my work and with all the things that I was learning about nature. Uh, it's natural form is curved. We define nature in terms of uh, light. I, I showed her photographs of the ocean in Pacifica, California, and she was t very taken with my philosophy of, of, of leaving the square, which was always her method of the format that she was using was a traditional square photographic uh, two-dimensional painting. Mm. And, and when I started speaking about the curvature the nat in nature is round, I mentioned that Einstein's idea was that all space is curved. She was very intrigued with the idea of sculptural work coming from the uh, experience of landscape. She started to see it in a new way. Did you correspond this, these ideas through letters? Yes, we or did. did you speak yes. with her on the phone? Well, the first letter that she wrote to me was in purchasing the obsidian, which was a form and relief defined by space and by light. And I had made that very evident by bringing samples of obsidian to her. The obsidian uh, specimens that I brought were from Topeak in Mexico. I had found them along the roadside. I, in fact, there were miles of it everywhere you looked. And I had my VW van and I was, I was out there chipping hunks of, of obsidian and I brought her a piece of obsidian. And I held it in my palm and I rubbed it and she did the same thing when she looked at it. She smoothed her hand over it in the most beautiful way. We both had this respect for things that were unknown to us but that we thought were beautiful and and she said I should have glass shelves put in here for you and then I said I thought well it's a triumph but of all the obsidian that was out there how, how would you really do it justice well it was a good thought because she was implying that I you know you should live here you should bring your beautiful minerals here. We, we could share this. It was something she was intrigued by and that I felt very dearly had influenced my, my ideas and, mm -hmm. and that uh, she felt that too. So yeah, she bought Obsidian, which was the first piece in 1968 and as a result she wrote a letter. I would oh. like to buy your, or I would, I will do not sell your car or part with your dog which were the main considerations. I owed $20 in my pocket when I visited her. Just enough to get back for gas to Mexico, to Lake Chapala. And she said, and when I arrived, the letter was there in, it was in general delivery in that rural post office where donkeys were walking on the street and there was no one that would have cared whether that letter was delivered or not. And here it arrived. And it was from Abiquiu, New Mexico. Dear Marilyn, at the time she called me Marilyn, and she said, do not sell your car or part with your dog. I will send you the next 2,000. You need to get your next three paintings done. And she, she uh, showed her, uh, I guess she, that was it. That was the be real beginning of our letters. And after that, she sent me other letters saying, uh, don't worry about getting your work here right away, just, just uh, do your work. I think it's more important that you work. Uh, uh, do not, uh, then she would say, I want you to be free in your mind. Uh, and that, let me tell you, as an artist, is the most valuable thing we need is freedom. The freedom of our mind rather than in, in the focus to be able to have at least some creature comforts so that you can buy gas, buy food, buy, pay your rent, uh, pay for the studio. I mean at that time I paid eight dollars for my my studio rent. 
I mean, that sounds a what bit... What year was that? That was 1968. Wow. Uh, I, I mean, I paid $16 a month for my rent on my home, or we, what I would call this, the home, and then I walked over to a place that had electricity in San Pedro, Texas, Stan, and that was $8 a month. So with this $2,000, after you did your work, did you go back to visit her? Oh, absolutely. Continued? Yeah, no, no. <clears throat> I mean, that was the great beginning. Uh, we, we, we then went on to uh, uh, the next year in, in 1969. I, I think she, I knocked her socks off <laughs> because I brought her 27 pastel drawings that she, she had never envisioned. She thought it, they were the most wonder. She said to me, "I wish I could have done them myself." And what she, a compliment! She did. She she took them around the baseboard of her studio. I unwrapped them. They were matted and and boards, and she put them all. And she went through a process of sorting through the twenty-seven. First of all, she said, "Where did you get the idea? Why did you set, bring twenty-seven? It was something clear like that. She was never roundabout in her questions. It was always direct. And I said, because that's where I stopped when I decided to come to see you. Well, she couldn't get over this. To her, this was a, I think, a sign that somehow Steiglitz was involved in this relationship because she said that was his favorite number. Wow. Uh, and so that seemed to have great weight to her and then she uh, sorted them out into groups of three and three and three that she thought were the best and she said these are the best because no one can criticize them and I thought that was good advice although I thought they were all you know they, they, to me, they, they had a progression. I mean, they were numbered chronologically, uh, and uh, such as uh, they were. So I still have a couple of them, but I put them up for sale with Jean Seth in the Canyon Road Art Gallery in Santa Fe. As mm -hmm. a result, Jean sold a number of them, and I had a few thousand to work with then. Uh, that was O'Keeffe's plan. And then 